Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to this week's roundtable. I'm in person with Jeff Dodge. Ooh. Yes. Um, well, we've been rehearsing for the last hour. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a well-produced conversation for you today. But anyway, um, yeah, the question I want to thing I want to talk about this week is um, what's the lemonade that you've been making uh, out of the lemons we've been given here in 2020. What's, what are the ways that, that you're seeing God at work in the kingdom of God? And just, I think we, we all need encouragement totally. and eyes to see the kingdom and what God's doing. And so, yeah. Yeah. We, we actually were talking about this uh, before we hit record of just, I don't know if you all are feeling it. I'm feeling though, this growing kind of ominous, uh, pessimism <laughs> coming over people like, mm. oh, days are getting shorter and flu season in addition to COVID. And are they going to shut things down again? And just this kind of growing like fear of what, what's next, what's next. And uh, I guess I, I was just saying to Mark, like if we and all of anybody that might tune in need is just hope and encouragement right now, right? Mm -hmm. to, to fight back the darkness of gloom, the darkness of pessimism and fear is just joy. So for me, at least one of those things has been, we decided to do this 30 days of, of prayer was not my idea. Drew Stevenson up at Salt City uh, has do, doing something similar. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what they did, but just the idea was birthed from them of just 30 days up to the election, which I don't have to say it, but has been pretty tumultuous and chaotic and uh, jarring, I guess, spiritually jarring. So just to start with Psalm 30, 29, 20, and just go through one by one up to election day, just like, I need the mind of Christ. I just need to turn down the volume of social media pundits telling me what to think and trying to attract me to this candidate or that. Tune those voices down, tune up the voice of God and just say at least one oasis for my soul each day is going to be to pray through one of those Psalms. And uh, mm -hmm. not that those Psalms are actually well selected for this, like some of them. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's in the Bible? How do I pray yeah. through that? So it's not like they're perfectly selected for the season, but it just forces me to think yeah. about the things of God, right? Yeah. I mean, it just gets me to yeah. think about the mind of Christ instead of the mind of everybody yeah. else so, so for me at least that's been one more i don't know way that god's infused some new hope fresh yeah. hope in my soul i was i was just i'm looking at this book this is one of my one of my favorite books working the angles by eugene peterson and uh i was your 30 days of prayer i was i was doing one of the psalms mm -hmm. today and and kind of thinking through that and and i it got me back into this book because i remember he he basically is uh the book is the subtitle is the shape of pastoral integrity. And he says, uh, and he's kind of teaching pastors mm -hmm. how to get back to the basics yeah. and prayer. I remember prayer. when that book came out actually. Really? Yeah. Just because it, I feel like you remember stuff from books better though. <laughs> like you're like, well, I remember what he wrote about. It. I'm like, ah, oh, shoot. I remember he wrote a book about that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's but, yeah. This one of my mentors and, uh, gave me this early on yeah. and uh was was just like this it, this is your handbook for christian ministry well after you started talking about it, it makes me want to go back and reread it because now as you're refreshing me i think it's more pertinent for today oh, than even listen, listen to this <laughs> listen to this you yeah this well this intro is like the second volume this provides uh an antidote to the powerful pressures that reduce pastoral vocation to a managerial religious job of running a church by defining the distinctive work of the pastor as listening and helping others to listen to God as he speaks in scripture, prayer, and the neighbor. Oh my word. Isn't that any, this is the opening paragraph wow. in his introduction. American pastors are abandoning their posts left and right at an alarming rate. They are not leaving their churches and getting other jobs. Congregations still pay their salaries. Their names remain on the church stationery, and they continue to appear in the pulpits on Sundays, but they are abandoning their posts, their calling. They have gone whoring after other gods. What they do with their time under the guise of pastoral ministry hasn't the remotest connection 
with what the church's pastors have done mm. for most of 20 centuries. Oh, man. The pastor's responsibility is to keep the community attentive to God. Oh. And that's where oh, I yeah. felt. I felt uh, the 30 days of prayer is, um, I'm glad to, to be partnered with you in ministry because that was kind of your, through Drew, saying we, we need to get our focus back on the Lord during this time. Sure. And, and as I reread some of this stuff, I, it, just, it just absolutely rocked me on this. Um, and I, I was, if I can find it here, I want to read this section on uh, prayer that, that oh, yeah. he, um, he, talks about, he talks about prayer. Um, oh, lots of gems in here, like the G.K. Chesterton quote, this has nothing to do with what I was going to talk about. But he said, <laughs> G.K. Chesterton said that tradition is the only true democracy because it means giving a vote to your ancestors. So, and along with that, I'll give you a, a moment to find the prayer thing. <laughs> That's something <laughs> because, so Veritas School of Theology, uh, reading a lot of uh, great, great textbooks, along with a lot of Bible along the way, but uh, one of our students, in fact, I think the oldest student in VSC, uh, two, two weeks ago, or no, last week, they had to read Athanasius on the Incarnation. So we're talking about far and away the oldest book that is in our repertoire of VST, centuries old, and he's like, that is the best book that we have ever read in VST. <laughs> you know I, but it just delighted me, you know, like there's a That's reason awesome. some of those ancient voices they still need a vote you know we still need athanasius yeah. to remind us on this reading was on the incarnation like uh yep. why we should still glory in the incarnation you know yep. and why his voice still still matters so this is this is his thing on i i, I still remember that i've read this for the first time in 1998 mm -hmm. and um and i still remember this paragraph he says he's talking about how um we learn to pray like a child learns to speak the way that a human being learns to speak is you have you have people that are constantly telling them words yeah. say mommy daddy and and so he says our personal experience in acquiring language is congruent with the biblical witness and provides an accessible and inexpensive laboratory for verifying genesis and john because we learned language so early in our lives we have no clear memory of the process mm. but by observing our own children learning to speak we readily enough confirm the obvious. Language is spoken into us. We learn language by being spoken to. We are plunged at birth into a sea of language. We swim in words. We are soaked in nouns and verbs. Gradually, we realize that some of these words are directed to us, personally targeted words that name love and comfort. Then slowly, syllable by syllable, we acquire the capacity to answer. Mama, Papa, bottle, blanket, yes, no. Not one of these words was a first word. Mm. Hundreds of thousands of words for days and weeks and months were spoken to us before we began to answer, to speak our own words. All speech is answering speech. Mm. We were all spoken to before we spoke. Question, where can we go to learn our language as it develops into maturity, as it answers God? Answer, the Psalms. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, which goes back to even what I said kind of jokingly about some of the Psalms we're encountering in, in 1 through 30. Some of them cause us to pray in ways that aren't within the boundary lines of how we would normally pray. You know? So how do, we, how do we need to learn how to pray it's by having prayers spoken to us, you know, in Eugene oh. Peterson language. And then we find ourselves like dangerously kind of praying those things back out loud, you know, and uh, yep. that's beautiful. It's, it's, I think it's, I think the, the uh, learning the impulse for, for prayer to be the first thing you do when you encounter a problem mm. is, is so important. Even now, like I, I have this, I read this thing and it made me angry. I need to stop and pray. I feel like I need to comment on this person's right. social media post. I need to stop and I need to pray. Mm. Um, we're thinking about doing this really exciting new ministry or we're doing whatever it is that we're doing. 
um, just learning for that first mm. impulse to pray. And he says, um, he says the inner action of prayer takes precedence over the outer action of proclamation. The implication of this for pastoral work is plain. It begins in prayer. Anything creative, anything powerful, anything biblical, insofar as we are participants in it, originates in prayer. Pastors who imitate the preaching and moral action of the prophets without also imitating the prophets' mm. deep praying and worship, so evident in the Psalms, are an embarrassment to the faith and an encumbrance to the church. <laughs> That's but so isn't it crazy how in, in any, anything, like if, if we can be prayerless as pastors, yeah. How much more anyone else in any line of work? It's just yes. we drift toward prayerlessness. Totally. And well, that's why even, I don't know if you even saw my email to our Zambian friends today, but we, you guys, we're embarking on yet one more ridiculous journey in Africa and Zambia. <laughs> we have no business. It's amazing. <laughs> Scandalously over our heads. Okay, so anyway, um, understanding the breadth of, of what we might try to accomplish there just found myself. And I think honestly, just because I've been tethered now to the Psalms and, and praying these last days, uh, found myself in my letter to our Zambian friends, not just saying, Hey, we should pray about this, but I just wrote out my prayer that I was kind of forming in my head. as I'm and I found myself that that became once again, the most spontaneous thing. And I don't often do that, especially yeah. in an email or something, you know, like type out a prayer, but it, it all of a sudden seemed like the most appropriate thing, not just to say, Hey, Jonathan, Miriam, novice, let's all pray. No, dear father, <laughs> you know, I just started praying yeah. as I was typing yeah. and, and I'm saying, I need to be tethered to prayer. And it's only because God mm -hmm. has been praying into my life yeah. through the Psalms that I'm, I'm finding it more re reflexively mm. coming out, you know, wow. more spontaneously, naturally or whatever, but, but take me away from those kind of practices. And I'm telling I drift away from that habit in a moment. So. It's, it's not, yeah. The first thing I often think to do, but I was talking to a, a fellow pastor who called just struggling through a staff challenge, mm. you know, today and, and just being able to end with, man, I don't know what to tell you, but can we just pray? Oh, man. And I think that's a great question, um, mm. you know, especially now, if you don't know what to say, just like, hey, can we pray about oh, this? Man. And um, yeah, I've been encouraged through the 30 days of prayer, through that, to to be prayerful. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that would be something I, I would love to look back on this time yeah. and say 2020 was a year that I, I learned how to pray. I oh, to pray. for sure. So for sure yeah be cool so what else is what else are you seeing god do right now what's yeah i uh had an opportunity this last week uh marilyn might even be watching this but uh my sister-in-law marilyn is has stage four cancer and has actually for almost a calendar year now been battling and so <clears throat> um but we met together Teresa and i met met them to pick out her burial plot and it, it's in this beautiful, just quaint little town, St. Donatus, uh, south of Dubuque. And um, and there was something really beautiful, like that Ecclesiastes 7 2, you know, better go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. There was something really right about watching Maryland. Like, we're going to this just, I don't know if the word beatific is right, but this just crazy, beautiful, old, old, 150 year old cemetery. And when she just kind of found the spot that she really felt like was where she wanted to be buried, that's where she wanted her children to come to, you know, mm. and she found a bunch of pine cones and piled the little pine cones up on the exact spot so that when the guy unrolled his, his plots, you know, of where the available uh, uh, spots were, you know, that it could be marked, you know, and I don't know, it was just, it, it was a beautiful, oh, you found Can it? Can I show uh, the yeah, picture? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just as the picture you texted me. Yeah, so. uh, yeah. It almost looks uh, like Europe or something, you know, you're up on this amazing bluff, just looking down. Uh, there's sheep uh, grazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> sheep, right. Because there's this path 
just above on the uh, as the hill goes up there's the, the church the cemetery and then as the summit continues up there's actually this path that you can take to visit the 14 stations of the cross this catholic cemetery and then there's a chapel way on the top of mm. the hill overlooking this in, entire valley so anyway just actually finding ourselves naturally talking about her upcoming death mm. and then that got us talking about her funeral and her funeral plans and the, what would happen when we got to that spot there mm. um i i can't even believe i'm using this as like a highlight or some a, a point of optimism in, in the midst of this but honestly you guys all of us have a shelf life right all of us are going to face mm -hmm. um our mortal death and maybe these times of covid and fear all this also it's a good time to just say mm -hmm. actually here here's what i told a, a friend of mine i said you know what through all this i take myself way too seriously mm -hmm. the decisions that i'm making with way less consequence because i recognize i've got to keep my eye on the grave and what goes on beyond the grave wow and if i keep keep my eye on my own yeah. mortality which you know my body's going to be buried in orchard iowa you know if i keep my honestly that focus like Actually, there's a spot already picked out that my body's going to get thrown in. You know, there's something right. centering about that because then what goes on beyond the grave? You got to enjoy it for me. You got to share this, the meaning of this picture. Um, that, no, no, no. This is, <laughs> it was a different one. No, I'm not going to show that one. Uh, uh, yeah, there's, okay. Can I find it here? It's the, uh, yes, it's this one. Here we go. Um, explain what this is. This is the picture of the, the stump. The oh old stump yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah all those trees. so here's what's cool so yeah you can see all the new <laughs> new trees up there all the stuff so right on the other side of the fence line from the plot that marilyn and terry picked out um there are these huge you could tell magnificent trees had been there these huge stumps now graying and decaying i don't know how long ago they had been cut down but a while ago because they're just you know clearly old and then the row just behind the people who take care of the church grounds had planted this row of just gorgeous, uh, like hardwood native Iowa trees, you know, oaks mm -hmm. and maples and stuff. And they're just beautiful, full of life. Somebody's really taking care of those baby sapling trees, you know? And all of a sudden I just felt like God gave me this, this moment. And obviously I'm there at a cemetery. So um, I'm thinking about my own mortal death as well. And I was like, yeah that is going to that's the way mm. of god like at some point i die i am off the earth i'm popped in one of these kind of plots like those trees that used to flourish and give shade they're gone oh but there's that next generation rising up right behind them to take their place and at some point those stumps will not even be visible like they'll continue to decay and become part of the earth but those n next oaks and maples and elms will just dominate and and be gorgeous i'm sure you know 50 years from now and so i just was texting uh mark and and ryan hamby and just saying man you guys i'm just having one of those moments you know my kids always laugh dad's having a moment you know so i was having a moment there of just saying wow god thank you that i get to be part of seeing young saplings put in the ground even before mm. i die you know knowing that i will certainly not be here forever and yet the gospel continues like we invest our lives in that next generation so that they in turn can go on and flourish and, mm -hmm. and bring to to that part of creation what they're intended to and so yeah just think about all the young guns around here you know these men and women last night had a had vst and it's just thrilling for me to embrace the fact that they are the future mm -hmm. and they are about to flourish and take their rightful place wow. so yeah, i was, was, I was hanging out with uh austin claver this morning our 23 oh. year old youth pastor and uh he's awesome. uh such an incredible dude and we were talking about this his future and thinking about that and i was using the um the the metaphor of the you know the oak tree mm -hmm. seed you know the oaks they they go way down mm -hmm. before they sprout up right and and he was talking about yeah um, low and slow. I don't know if that was a phrase. Somehow, I think Rob Warren from Doxa like used that phrase, but it kind of it resonated with me this I idea of growth because I was encouraging him like just enjoy the season, like don't don't yeah. 
be too consumed with the future. Yeah. And what am I going to do? Am I going to, you know, and he's, cause he's got a great perspective, but that's always in, you know, you're mm-hmm. young and excited about future aspirations, aspirations, yeah, aspirations yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ambition. And that's good. But, but just the idea of, of low and slow, the Man. idea of like, stay humble and just respect the process that God has for you. And I was thinking about your, your tree metaphor, you yeah. know, and, and those saplings and, and it just, and they take a time. long time, right? Yeah. You're not, you're not planting, time. you know, a tomato plant, you know, that you're going to get one season out. No, these things are going to dominate that hill for years to come. And so yeah, they take a while, you yeah. know, and that's, that's great. For it was, guys like Austin to take your time, let your roots find mm-hmm. that nurturing soil. You're in a protected place right now. You're in a yep. safe place to really get grounded so that you can, you know, spend a lifetime. And I, I was talking to Cole Williams, one of our uh, SALT interns, and I was just asking him, I said, Cole, when you look back on 2020 and like mm. when you're an old person, you know, 30, 40 years from now, yeah. I said, what, what do you want to say about yourself in 2020? Like what, what do you want to be able to say? Yeah, this is what came, this is what came out of that for me. This is what, this is what was drawn out of me. Uh, this is what was true of my character in the middle of a pandemic and very hostile, divisive time. And he said, it was interesting. His response was, I think I want to be able to say that my roots, he, and he quoted Psalm 1, you know, mm. that my roots were planted by streams of water mm. and were just like deeply rooted in, in Christ and his word. And, and I think wow. um, that was a, such a cool, it inspired me to, For sure. to, uh, Toward that and we get to work with these guys. I know. <laughs> you know I mean? It's such a privilege. It's so fun. Oh, so, so fun. and I, I gotta I gotta share a story with you. This was actually from one of the old oak trees. They're still standing. Um, <laughs> an encouragement, but you guys, something happened to me yesterday that was so cool. And I got a note in the mail. Uh, and this is from Paul and Patty Tweet, mm-hmm. and they are just oak trees of yeah. righteousness and and such an encouragement the generation before that are cheering us on and and uh just in such cool ways but i got this letter and i want to share with you because we had just celebrated our our 10-year anniversary at veritas and so it's been a time of reflection for me of just gratitude to what god has done and you know it's like the 10-year celebration's over and okay next thing yeah and then I got this letter and um, I just want to, I want to read it and because it was so encouraging. She said, uh, dear Mark, I just wanted to share an interesting God moment that occurred this past weekend. Actually, um, her God moment is about to be mine as well. Mm-hmm. I was driving alone to my hometown, Fort Madison, Iowa, and then grabbed several music CDs to keep me company. Um, Thankfully, there are people that still listen to CDs (laughs) because this moment wouldn't have happened otherwise. So a new CD started to play and it wasn't music, but it was you teaching at Cornerstone on Matthew 24, 36 through 51 on July 26, 2009. No way. You mentioned that Cornerstone was thinking of planting a church in Iowa City and you mused. What would it be? What would be my response if I were asked to move there? You said you would question God about moving when you had just built a fence and installed a whole house vacuum system. (laughs) I just thought it was so special that this CD was stuck in with the music CDs and you were celebrating 10 years at Veritas after I had just heard what you said on July 26, 2009. Little did we know in 2009 that so many of our grandchildren would be involved with Veritas. So a lot of her grandchildren um, basically helped plant Veritas and are still involved. So, um, yeah, I mean, Luke and uh, Tess and Shay and now, um, you know, now uh, Jessica and Zach kind of in on that story and her granddaughter Miranda and she just said, we're still praying, um, you know, for you guys and um, so grateful. And so, um, yeah, she, That's she just unreal. said that. Isn't that amazing? That I mean, it amazing. was like, it was like God put that CD on play for her because listen to this. 
I was trying to figure, I had this vague memory of, of saying, saying this. Oh, no way. And I told James when he was making the video, I'm like, there's got to be something out there in the archives of something I said, like in 2009. And I even went through my sermon notes from all the yeah. times I preached. I couldn't find it. That and I was like, James, amazing. I have no idea where this is, but I seem to remember like off the, off the cuff saying something in a sermon about Iowa City. Uh, and this, and like, one more time, you can't make this stuff up. Oh my <laughs> word. That is so God beautiful. just like put this on play in Patty's uh, car so that this could be reminded. And can I just say, he found the perfect one to have that happen to. Like the angels were involved in that because a whole lot of people might have had that happen and either just, oh, what's this doing in there? Or, But she had this spiritual sensitivity to not only listen, wow. connect the dots, and then write that letter to you. You know what I mean? Oh, so thanks totally. be to God for the, the just beautiful mm. servants like Patty oh. that are God's means by which yeah. he could bless you with it. That's very cool. Yeah, she wasn't, she wasn't the baker cup bear which you won't forget yeah, yeah right yeah she didn't forget she, she she went yeah she did it so uh, anyway i look forward to writing patty <laughs> back so patty if you're listening um, uh to beautiful. begin to know that was that was just such a beautiful picture of of god at work in this time there's so many examples of this mm -hmm. um and i just think we've got to we got to stay prayerful yes and and just and humble walk humbly mm -hmm. um and keep going mm -hmm. whatever comes our way Right, it might get worse. Yeah, <laughs> you know things yeah. might get worse. I'm not. When I say we need to restore hope and optimism, it's not because I think, hey, better days are ahead. Just keep going. No, worse days might be ahead. But even if we're led into a darker part of the valley of the shadow of death, I want to go holding tightly to Jesus' hand. You know what I mean? I want to be connected to the vine. I want. I want to know His voice is speaking truth and guiding me along the way. So, yeah. um, I don't have rose-colored glasses about the future at all. I think we should be prepared for good days or worse days. Mm -hmm. Either way, I want, I want Jesus right out front. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. Leaning in. So. Nah. Well, why don't you, yeah, if you could pray for us. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um, how can we thank you enough? And I find myself getting a little emotional when I think of just that gift that you gave to Patty, to Mark. Um, Thank you for those little moments that just keep us remembering that you are supernatural. You are alive. Mm -hmm. Your gaze is fixed on your people. You care deeply for all of us. And so, Lord, um, I think of Psalm 8. What is man? <laughs> you are mindful of us. What, why are you thinking about us? I can't, I can't understand it. All I know is I am so deeply grateful that you are mindful of us, Lord. And so mm -hmm. thank you for loving us, shepherding us, guiding us. And thanks for moments of hope and joy like we have right mm -hmm. now. God, we love you deeply. Mm -hmm. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week.